can see. Thomas Paine, who is one of my personal greatest philosophical influences, one of the uh, people who is uh, really one of the uh, core philosophers of the American Revolution and the principles that founded this country uh, about freedom and about sovereignty. He made this statement regarding religion, which I personally resonate with and have for many, many years. I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church that I know of. My own mind is my own church. All national institution of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. That is what organized religion is really about. It is a methodology of control, specifically mind control, through fear. Through fear of the unknown, through fear of the, uh, the, 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 the unexplained aspects of ourselves, of how we are actually connected to divinity. And we need no priest to experience that. We must become our own priests, our own uh, shamans, if you will, to experience the divine within us. And uh, Thomas Paine's quote there perfectly um, uh, uh, encapsulates how I feel about religion in general. It's, and moreover, it's because I understand the word religion and what it really means. The word religion is from the Latin religare, and religare means to tie back, to hold back, or to bind fast. It does not mean to reconnect, as many individuals will translate the word religion. If you look up the word religare, which is where the word religion is derived, it means to tie by binding. That is what the word actually means. If you know how to connotatively translate Latin and you know the true etymology of words, religion means binding or to hold back by tying. And what is it binding? What is binding? Yeah. Here, to, to prove the point in a Latin dictionary, I look up the verb religare and it says, to tie out of the way, to bind fast, or to more. I'll be presenting a couple of these you know, um, uh, dictionary lookups just to prove w w the actual etymology of the word so someone doesn't have to take my word for it. So religion is binding, but what is binding? What is binding in actual magical practice, in occult circles, in occult parlance? What does binding mean? Well, binding is a magical term. And it is descriptive of a class of spells intended to thwart or hold back the progress of an opposing force or practitioner. So that's what binding is, to thwart or hold back, to tie out of the way. That's what religion is, a binding. So what is it trying to bind? If it's binding something, what is it binding? Well, I call this the dartboard of truth. Okay? This is... The, the religious traditions of the world all around the outside, inside in, in the inner circle you have the mystical traditions, but then there's the core of truth. That's what all religions ultimately share. But it's also what the exoteric aspect of the religion is trying to hold you back from. That's what it's binding. Religion is saying this shell out here is what the truth is. It's saying don't look here and certainly don't look here. Take our word that this is what it is here. So religious traditions are exoteric, meaning on the outside, of the, on the periphery. The esoteric or the mystical traditions come much deeper and closer to the core of truth they're, they may not be at the bullseye, at the very core or the heart of the truth itself, but they're much closer. They guard the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, the true secrets, the, the, the thing that really connects people to truth, that, that is, is indwelling. 
So that's what we want to get to. We want to get to that bullseye. Religions are here to act as a shell to prevent us from getting to that core. And that's what they're binding. Isn't to say that there isn't truth to be found within any of them. But to look, again, it's, it's, a, it's a box for consciousness. You're looking into any given religion, you're not seeing the whole picture. And the thing that most people do not see when they look into a religion or when they become part of a religion is that all religions share one common thread. They are all essentially astrotheology in disguise. What astrotheology is, it is the placing as gods the, the planetary bodies and the, the astronomical bodies that we see in the sky. So it is essentially the worship of the gods in the sky, the planets, the stars, the sun, and the moon. So there are three major groups of astrotheological worship. There is a, um, a, a, a aspect of astrotheology that is dedicated to the smaller lights in the heavens, the the pinpoints of light, so to speak. They're the the sun. I'm sorry, the stars and the planets. Okay, so the the, the small lights of the heavens are the stars and planets, all the little pinpoints of light that we see in the night sky. That's one of the uh, 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 bodies of worship for astrotheology. Uh, and the other two are the large lights that we see in the heavens, the sun and the moon. So you have three major groupings, or let's say sects, of astrotheology. You have the worshippers of the sun, the worshippers of the moon, and then the worshippers of the small lights, the stars and planets. And I'm going to choose one of them to tell the story of how that particular religion is given to one of these aspects of astronomical bodies. And since it is the religion that I was indoctrinated into when I, when I was young, I'm going to choose Christianity. And I'm going to tell the story of how essentially Christianity is an ancient sun worship religion. So I'm going to use, there are many different cultural uh, myths and cultural um, re religious uh, ideologies that I could have went to to discuss the story of the sun, but I'm choosing the Egyptian culture because I think it's probably the clearest example. This is one of the gods of ancient Egypt known as Horus. Horus, H-O-R-U-S. Horus was known as the golden falcon in Egyptian cosmology. He was the sun god, the solar disk that rises in the east and makes, he flies across the sky in, in, his, in an arc. Okay? He, he flies across the sky in his solar arc. He makes an arc across the sky until he reaches the west at sunset. So Horus is a golden bird. He's a bird that is, that is gold, a falcon, and he makes his trek across the sky daily. The word horizon is, uh, it means the zone of Horus. Hori, H-O-R-I, is the genitive or the possessive word for Horus. It means Horuses or of Horus. Zone, the horizon, the zone of Horus. That's where Horus appears during the day, on the horizon. The horizon. He makes his trek across the sky, and then he goes into the west at sunset. Okay? So... Horus has three main family members that you need to understand the role that they play in this story. He has a mother, a father, and a brother. His mother is depicted here, Isis. Isis is the goddess of the night sky in Egyptian cosmology. She is often also identified as the moon goddess. So at night, when the sun is not up, the moon is the queen of the heavens. She rules the night sky. The, her cloak is the dark cloak that the stars are embedded in. Okay? So she's the goddess of night and the, the goddess, the moon is her, her presence when the moon is out and you see it at night. So 
this dark feminine moon goddess that also represents the cloak, the black cloak of the night sky with all the stars embedded in it, each day gives birth to the rising sun. She gives birth to God's sun, the sun that is owned by the God of the heavens, Osiris, the father God, the creator God. Horus is the son of Osiris. He is the creator God's son. Here you see the solar disk above his head. And the divine mother, Isis, gives birth each day to the solar God. When the, the, the sun is born of the night sky. Horus is depicted right here. He is, he is touching Osiris on his right hand temple. His dark brother, Set, depicted right here, okay, is touching Osiris in this picture on his left temple. This is the idea of conscience. This is the idea that Horus is the right mind. He is the connection to the right brain. So he's touching Osiris on his right side of the brain hemisphere. So this is moral action. He's the male principle that's born of the feminine principle of emotions. Right? This is the goddess of emotion. The feminine goddess. The Holy Spirit. Our emotions. And our emotions are what give birth to proper moral action. So he is the light of the sky. He's touching the right brain. Right? On the left, you have the god of darkness. He's known as Set in the Egyptian uh, uh, pantheon of gods, in Egyptian cosmology. Set is the one who comes at night when the sun is setting. This is where we get the word set, the sun set from. And he conquers the light. He conquers Horus and darkness prevails. So this is, this is one who is in ignorance if one is in worship of sect. This is the dark god. It's associated with darkness, ignorance, and the light going out. And look, he's touching the left brain, which tells you if you're too left brain, your actions are not in moral rightness. You're not in the light, you're in the darkness when the light is put to death. So this is like the concept of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder of conscience. One's whispering in your ear to do the wrong thing, one's whispering in your ear to do the right thing. And Horus was known as, he's a god of, of uprightness, of righteousness, the savior of the world, the god of light, the solar disk. And Set is the god of darkness that conquers the light. So you see here the trinity. Osiris is our thoughts. Isis, our emotions. And Horus and Set, our actions. One is born of moral uprightness, and one is a god of darkness and ignorance. It's a, a, a beautiful moral um, symbolic analogy. If we take it as an expression of consciousness symbolically and not as physical gods in the sky. So here we see another statue from ancient Egypt of um, Osiris, the middle pillar, our thoughts. And then you have Horus, the male principle of action, alongside Isis, the feminine lunar goddess of emotion. Here you have again the Yang principle the yin principle and the mixture between the two. The coming together of the male and the female. Or thought, emotion, and action coming together as one. So here on the left we see Horus uh, as the child with his mother Isis. And on the right we see the, the uh, comparable image of Mary with the, uh, the Madonna with the child of, of Jesus. Now there, there's a, a couple of reasons why they are uh, a virgin goddess and they give birth to a male child that is not born of a male 
sexual un a union with uh, sexual union with a male. The reason for that is Isis represents the intuitive brain. She represents the midbrain where conscience and intuition come from. When one conquers the reptile brain and is getting in touch with the right brain of conscience and into of conscience and intuition, one has conquered the, the, the father, the controller part of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, the reptile brain, and it is a virgin birth. The 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 Feminine limbic brain is giving birth to the neocortex, the divine male child of proper moral action into the world. So it's a it's a virgin birth. We're going to see how even that idea is 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 covered over by astrotheological uh, ideas, and it's it's just looked at as that's the place where the sun is born in the zodiac, which we'll get into. And look at this these images of Mary. Uh, depicted as the queen of heaven with her crown on in each example. She is the moon goddess. She wears the dark cloak with the stars embedded in it. The cloak of the night sky with the stars. And in each example, here in this example, you actually see the crescent moon at her feet. She is the lunar goddess. And in each example, she is giving birth to the child of Enlight, enlightenment, the moral solar principle of proper moral action. Here you see Jesus depicted as laying on uh, hay, which is actually the radiant rays of the sun. Here you see him coming out from beneath the cloak of the heavens being born, the night sky bearing the soul, uh, solar male child during the day. And here you see from her cloak, here is the sacred heart of Jesus being born in the flames of the sun. So in every example, you're seeing the queen of heaven, the night sky, the lunar goddess, giving birth to the, the child of moral action, the sun. Now, to understand how the story of consciousness, which is Christianity, it, it actually, there is a real religion of Christianity underneath the astro-theological uh, 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 trappings of it that it is wrapped in to sell as a binding. And that's it. It is the story of how proper moral action is given birth to in the world. It's given, it's a, it's a virgin birth because the R complex has been conquered. The limbic brain is our intuitive brain that, that governs our emotions and we feel that those emotions and so it helps to give birth to the, the properly balanced neocortex, the savior of the world. So, to understand the story as an astrotheological metaphor, we have to understand two basic concepts in astronomy that aren't too complicated. One is what creates the seasons of the year, and the other is what is the procession of the equinoxes. So, I'll take the first one, what creates our seasons? Our seasons are created simply because of the tilt of the earth in relation to the plane that it orbits our sun in. That's all. It is, has nothing to do, the earth doesn't vary in great distance uh, from the sun as it makes its journey around it during the year. It's, it's a, a uh, it is a slightly elliptical orbit, for, but for our intents and purposes, we can consider it as a circle. So it has nothing to do with distance from the sun. It is simply the tilt of the Earth on its own axis of rotation. That's the only thing that really creates our seasons. So let's look at this. Here the sun is at the... the um, I'll start at the autumn equinox. The autumn equinox, the sun is directly at the equator of the earth. Okay, so see that angle that the sun is making with the equator of the earth? It's right at the equator, right at that point. Okay, so the sun is right at the equator, zero degree, no, no angle. It's the, if you went to the equator and looked straight up, at that day, the sun is right at the equator. It's not in the northern hemisphere, it's not in the southern hemisphere. As the sun makes, as the earth makes its journey around the sun, 
Later in the year, it arrives at the winter solstice. And you see that the tilt of the Earth doesn't change as it goes around this, this plane of, the, uh, uh, of its orbit. Here, it's making an, an, a different angle with respect to the Sun. So look at where the Sun is striking the Earth at. It's striking the Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. Here's the equator. Here's the Northern Hemisphere. Here's the Southern Hemisphere. So the angle that it's making is toward the Southern Hemisphere. So the Sun started here and now went down to here. So now, at this point, the winter solstice, the Sun is now at a 23.5 degree south angle. The next uh, time of the year is the spring equinox, and the Sun has now moved from its southerly position, and it's gone back to the equator. So it is back at a zero degree mark with relationship to the Sun. Then we get we go t toward the spring season and to the summer solstice, the beginning of summer. So at this point, we see here's the equator of the Earth, here is the Sun, and here's the angle that it's striking the Earth at, and we see that now it's in the northern hemisphere. It's striking the Earth at a 23.5 degree north angle. So now the, the northern hemisphere is favored by the sun during the season, and that's why it's the beginning of summer for us. When the southern hemisphere is favored by the sun here, that's summer in the southern hemisphere and winter in the northern hemisphere. Okay? So that is what creates the seasons. The tilt of the earth with respect to uh, it, its its plane of orbit around the sun. And essentially we can look at this a different way. We can just look at it as here's where the angle with the, earth, uh, with the sun starts. If I am the earth and the sun is directly out from the equator, this is the autumn equinox. Okay? At the winter solstice it goes down by 23.5 degrees. Spring equinox it comes back up. Summer solstice. Autumn equinox, winter solstice, spring equinox, summer solstice. And this process just keeps repeating like a sine wave as the seasons go on. It's just up and down, up and down. Okay? It's, it's a, like a pendulum movement. So the next concept in astronomy to understand is the precession of the equinoxes. There is another reference frame of motion at work, which I won't get into the, 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 the full mechanics of, but you just need to know that the background of stars behind the solar path, the constellations that make up the zodiac, they're in what's called the solar ecliptic path, they slowly go backwards throughout a very long period of time. They slowly precess counterclockwise, okay? So at the, um, at the spring equinox, okay, the, um, the, 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 the constellation that is in, that the sun is in at the spring equinox over a very long period of time begins to shift and a new constellation comes in and it is behind the sun at the spring equinox. And this keeps going until it makes one complete revolution through the zodiac. So the, the frame of reference that, of what the Earth is, the pole of the Earth is pointing to, actually makes a full circle in the sky. And it is not because the Earth itself is wobbling on its axis, but I will not get into what really causes that reference frame. But uh, over a long period of time, approximately 25,000 years, a complete circle is made, and at the spring equinox, every constellation has been gone through until you come back to the first one. So that's called the precession of the equinoxes. So just keep that in mind. You don't need to fully understand that right now, just keep it in mind. So this is the story that the ancients told about the sun on the wheel of the zodiac. This is the zodiac 
Uh, it has all the constellations that the sun goes through during its course of the year. And the ancients would quarter this to create the seasons. So they placed a cross over the zodiac wheel and they looked at it as these three constellations are the spring season, these three are when the sun is in the summer season, these three are the autumn season, and these three are the winter season. Okay. The ancients then placed the sun on the cross of the zodiac and they would tell its story of its journey through the, the, the houses of the zodiac, through the constellations, during the course of a, a year. So I'm going to start where we begin our zodiacal year in Aries at the spring equinox. So the sun here is at zero degrees. It is at the equator and it's starting to make its journey up northward into the northern hemisphere. So during these six months, the sun's in the northern hemisphere. During these six months, the sun is in the southern hemisphere. So here's the point of the zero point, and it starts rising. Now when it hits Taurus, Taurus, the bull, the midpoint of the spring season, the sun has become a charging bull. He's gaining strength because he's rising in the northern hemisphere. When he hits this point, this is the summer solstice, the sun has gone as high in relation to its angle of the latitude of Earth as he's going to go. So he's at his highest point in the northern hemisphere, 23.5 degrees north latitude of the Earth. This is known as the Tropic of Cancer. That line, the latitude on the Earth, is called the Tropic of Cancer. And because the sun is entering the house of Cancer, the constellation of Cancer, at that point during the year. Um, this is the summer solstice. It is the longest day of the year as far as light goes because the tilt of the earth makes the northern hemisphere of the earth favored. Now, the sun is entering the summer season and he's traveling toward Leo the lion. This is the season that the sun is hottest in the northern hemisphere. He has become a roaring lion with a large mane. You know, the solar rays of the sun, the fierce lion. And then the sun makes his journey into Virgo. And that is, uh, after he passes that house, he's at the autumn equinox. Now, he's back at zero degrees now. And he's getting ready to fall into the southern hemisphere. This is why this season is called fall. The sun is making his descent to a, another uh, solstice, to its lowest point of power. Okay, So that's the season of fall. Now, this is where the story of Christianity starts to become involved in the telling of the astrotheological story of the sun on the cross of the zodiac. And it is because at this time of the year, when when the sun is in Virgo, getting ready to make his journey into the southern hemisphere, into Libra. Uh, while the sun is in Virgo, in the constellation of Virgo, when, when it is rising at the beginning of the day, there is a constellation beneath the house of Virgo, known as Crux. This is what Crux looks like. It's known as the Southern Cross, only visible from the southern hemisphere. So at this time, the ancients would say that the sun was on top of the cross of crooks. Not right on this, the sun doesn't go into this. The sun is here, it's over top of crooks because Virgo is on top of crooks in the night sky. You just need to look at a celestial map, you pinpoint uh, Virgo, and then you look lower toward the southern hemisphere, and you'll find crooks, the southern cross. So at this time of the year, the ancients said that the sun was placed upon the cross of crooks, the southern cross. And this marked the time that the sun was getting ready to begin to die, begin to go to his lowest point, the winter solstice. So in this season, the sun then passes through Scorpio the Scorpion. 
and he is stung by the venom of the scorpion. So now he's really in rapid decline. Okay? He's dying quickly because he's, he's uh, stung by the venom and he's dying and then he comes to the winter solstice. Now the sun is at 23.5 degrees south latitude of Earth. He is at the Tropic of Capricorn because he's getting ready to enter the house of Capricorn. This is the Tropic of Capricorn, 23.5 degrees south latitude of Earth. This is when the sun is at his winter solstice and the the ancients knew that was as far south as the sun would descend. It's making its lowest arc across the southerly sky that it's going to make. And that's the shortest day of the year as far as light goes. It's the day that is the longest day in darkness. So this is when the sun was said to have died upon the cross of the zodiac. He's at his lowest point of power and he has died upon the cross. So, uh, remembering that uh, at the autumn equinox point here is when the sun was placed upon the cross of crooks, the southern cross. And this point here at the winter solstice is when the sun dies on the cross of the zodiac. You see here that it passed through one, two, three zodiac houses to reach that point. This is a symbolic corollary to the story that Jesus hung upon the cross for three hours, three Horus's hours, before he expires upon the cross. So in this instance, from the autumn equinox to the winter solstice, these three uh, zodiac constellations are seen symbolically as hours. So, at the winter solstice, the sun has reached his lowest point in the southern hemisphere. And um, this is, at this point, the ancients could see with the eye no visible movement of the sun back toward the northern hemisphere for approximately three days. So, the winter solstice takes place on December 22nd. For three days, the sun is seen to be uh, stationary. And its arc is, is staying at the same uh, position and, and location in the sky as it rises and sets. It is not until three days later that the sun begins to make its uh, trek northward until that is visible to the naked eye. So the ancients would see the sun rising farther northward and its arc getting somewhat larger on the third day after the winter solstice. And that day, of course, is December the 25th, the birth date of the sun, because that is the day, visually, the sun can be seen to be, to be born from its place of death in the southern hemisphere and to begin to rise again or start the cycle again of rising and falling during the course of the year. So that is the date when the son, son of God is said to be born, and he is born of the Virgin. And we talked about what that really means, the, the birth of consciousness, the birth of the neocortex from the, the, the mammalian brain. However, in this context, context astrotheologically, it means that the son is born of Virgo. So that, at one point, was where... The, um, the, the, con the, the zodiac began. It, was, it, was, it began at this point, the, the, the line between Leo and Virgo. So at that point, the sun would be born of Virgo, the virgin, not of Aries. So if the, 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 the sun, um, the, uh, the uh, zodiacal year would begin at this point, it would travel in a circle until it reached Leo and back to the Leo-Virgo line. So, if you look at where Virgo is and you count the houses in procession, in the procession of equinoxes, okay, backwards, counterclockwise through the zodiac signs, you get nine months, and that is the human gestation period. The sun, if he is born of Virgo and carried to term for nine months until he is born at the winter solstice point.
So in that instance, the zodiacal houses are seen to be months symbolically. Here we saw them as hours, and here we see them as months, and we're going to see them as days as well. So uh, here we see a zodiac in stone. This is the Virgo, the Virgin, and Leo, the Lion, the Sphinx. It's uh, its position looking east toward the rising sun, and it commemorates the sun being born of the Virgin and the 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 um, track of the sun through the zodiacal houses until it ends up in Leo at the end of the uh, ancient zodiac. So the Sphinx is simply a zodiac in stone. Now, at the winter solstice, the sun then begins his track northward again. He goes through Aquarius, the water bringer, because the winter uh, uh, frost is beginning to thaw as we approach the spring equinox again. Okay, so that's the bringer of the waters. And then the sun comes back full circle to the spring equinox, the zero point again, when it is back at the, uh, uh, the zero point, the equator. And we see that at, at the point that he died in the southern hemisphere or in his tomb, after being placed on the cross, He's in his tomb of the southern hemisphere, and after one, two, three days, he comes back to the zero point to begin rising again in the northern hemisphere. So this is the rebirth of the sun, this is the emergence from the tomb of the southern hemisphere to the favored northern hemisphere. And that day is Easter Sunday, and think about the day. East star, sun, day. All concepts associated with light, the sun, and the sun is a star, it rises in the east, it's up during the day. So Easter Sunday is happens at a different date every year. It happens on the first sun day, the worship, the day of worship for Christianity is a solar religion, a solar astrotheological religion. And it occurs the first Sunday after the first full moon, because again, the lunar moon goddess must become full to bear the sun, after the spring equinox, or the rising of the sun from the spring equinox, out of the tomb of the southern hemisphere. So Easter Sunday is always celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. And this story of the sun savior that has 12 helpers, the 12 constellations of the zodiac, who is the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, has, uh, um, uh, performs miracles, um, rises from the dead after three days, has a virgin mother, is the son of God. Every one of these um, aspects of this savior story, the savior myth that is told over and over again through time. There are over 40 incarnations of this sun god. Every one of the names that you're about to see scroll by is one of the names of this ancient sun savior figure that comes from the east, is has uh, miraculous powers, uh, redeems the world through the light um, again, has 12 helpers, is the son of God, has a virgin birth, performs miracles, etc. Every one of those names is that same savior myth retold, and every one of those names predates Christianity. It predates uh, uh, the first century of the common era, often by thousands of years. Some of those names predate uh, the, the, uh, the time that Jesus uh, was said to have lived by 2,000 or even close to 3,000 years. Now, this is not to negate the understanding, the underlying moral lesson that Christianity has to teach. There is a core of truth. There is a religion that uh, perhaps an enlightened avatar that walked in uh, the land of Galilee at the first century uh, was attempting to uh, bear into the world and really help to awaken minds of his time. And I don't, uh, I don't necessarily um, try to negate that. That uh, it may have been 
a uh, teacher or a group of teachers. Um, however, I think that the uh, idea has been co-opted and it has been uh, turned into this story of the ancient pagan sun uh, savior myth in order to conceal the true message, the true message of what the virgin birth is, of what the savior of the world is, and what indeed the ideology that uh, perhaps an enlightened avatar at that time was trying to teach people and, and, and help to enlighten them to. And therefore the authorities of the time had to shut down that expansion of knowledge and they did it by taking it and perverting it and wrapping it in the old uh, sun worship uh, cult, the, 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 the cult of the unconquerable sun, Sol Invictus. And that's why uh, we see the story of Christianity uh, presented to the masses in the way that it is today. I don't think it negates the true moral lessons that can be gleaned from Christianity, but what we are seeing presented as Christianity and organized religion is certainly not the religion of Christ consciousness, so to speak, of higher levels of awareness, which is what I believe uh, that the, if you look into the true message of Christ, the true uh, teachings that are encapsulated in his words, uh, I don't think that's what modern Christianity is really teaching people. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, understood uh, that this is what Christianity was, and he brilliantly codified this in his painting of the Last Supper. If we look at the symbolism that's encoded into this painting, we see that we have a dark half of the room and a light half of the room. Okay, So again, this is the concept of the light and the dark. You can look at this as the male uh, aspect. right? You can look at this as the female aspect. right? So the yang energy, the yin energy. Jesus is the perfect blend of the two. He's the middle. He's the chemical wedding, so to speak. He's the savior, the light of the world, of higher consciousness. You see that he sits in the region where the light is really coming into the room because he's the sun. He is surrounded by his 12 helpers or his 12 apostles, the zodiac constellations. You see they're broken into groups of three, right? So this would be the winter season here. And then as, it, as you're rising, this would be the spring season, okay? Here, you're going toward, I'm sorry, this would be the autumn season. And of course, that would be Virgo. Okay. Um, now Virgo is in Virgo is actually in the summer season. Technically, it's above the line. So th this is the um, this is the um, <clears throat> autumn season. We see that he's surrounded by the twelve um, his twelve helpers, the twelve signs of the zodiac. We see that they're broken into groups of three, each group representing one of the seasons. Here in the dark part of the year, you have uh, winter and you have autumn. And then as you're going toward the light part of the year, summer in the northern hemisphere, here you have spring, this group here is spring, and the far group there is summer. Because uh, you see that the, the part when the, the sun is darkest, that would be winter, and you're, you're going up toward the summer season there. And Jesus is the equinoxes. He's the perfect balance between the two. So he is the star or the son of God at the gate, the star gate. And see, there's like chaos in the room. They're, they're not in agreement with each other. They're arguing or there's some conflict. And Jesus has a peaceful countenance on his face because he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's the blending of the male and female to awaken the, the, the prefrontal cortex and that is the way out of the world of conflict, confusion, and it is the way to the light of the, the world above, um, the connection with the light of the world above. So da Vinci encoded this all brilliantly into the Last Supper, and I think he had a real strong grasp of uh, what Christian, the real message of Christianity was versus what was being uh, sold to us in, uh, in astrotheology. So here we see the uh, seven planets, or gods, if you will, that are visible uh, to the earth with the naked eye. 
you have the Sun, you have Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are the seven gods of the ancient world. The, these are the, 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 the uh, planetary bodies that can be seen with the naked eye. One cannot see beyond Saturn without the aid of a telescope. We see that each day of the, of the week is given to one of these seven gods. So we have, we have the days of the week given in English and French, and then we have the planetary body that they are associated with. Monday is the moon's day. Tuesday in French is Meridi. It's where we get the phrase Meridi Gras from. That's Mars's day. Uh, interestingly, uh, the 9-11-2001 event took place on a Tuesday for the invocation of Mars, the Roman god of war. Wednesday is Mercredi in French. That's Mercury's day. Thursday is Thor's day in Norse ideology. Uh, Thor was Jupiter. Friday in French is Vendredi, that's Venus's day. Saturday and Sunday are relatively self-explanatory. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish religion is Saturnian based, it's the, the stars and planets, uh, astrotheologically, the religion of the stars and planets, and uh, therefore its day of worship is Saturday after Saturn, that the, who they considered, since it was the farthest body out from the from the sun that could be seen with the naked eye, it was considered the ruler of the planets. And then, of course, Sunday is the sun's day. The uh, Christianity worships on Sunday, being a solar cult. Our whole notion of time and how we see time is also affixed to the concepts of astrotheology. So we have the three astrotheological sects: the sun, the moon, the planets, and stars. And we look at our clock being a symbolic uh, zodiac. It has the 12 houses, okay? It has three hands. Each one of the three hands of an analog clock is given to one of the uh, sets of astrotheology, the solar, the lunar, and the planetary. So we see that the sun is given the hour hand, the most important hand, because it's the hand of Horus, the sun god. The minute hand is named after Min, which is an ancient name for the moon. Min was the moon uh, in, uh, in Phoenician. And uh, the, uh, the minute hand is, is dedicated to the moon on the clock. And the second hand is the fastest hand that travels around the clock more than any other any of the other hands because it is given to Mercury. It's the planetary hand or the, 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 the pinpoints of light in the sky, the lesser lights, because Mercury is the second body of the solar system after the Sun and it makes its orbit around the Sun faster than any other object in the solar system. So this takes us to the concept the last concept in uh, religion as astrotheology, that ultimately what we are seeing is the breakdown of consciousness on the earth. And we are seeing the earth as a global brain. This is a very critical concept to understand. It will help people to understand why the events that are playing out in the regions of the world that they are are happening the way that they are and in the locations that they are. So if we look at the Earth, if we consider that the Earth is a living brain, it is actually a con one consciousness, one brain. It has two hemispheres. We have a Western Hemisphere and an Eastern Hemisphere. So if we symbolically correlate this to the concept of the bilaterally symmetrical brain. We can place the structure of the brain on top of the Earth map. So we have a left hemisphere of the brain and we have a right hemisphere of the brain. So you want to picture that you're actually looking kind of this as, at the, as the back of the head. So this area is, the, let's say this is the back of the head. 
Okay? And this is the left hemisphere of the brain. That's the right hemisphere of the brain. So you need to envision your head looking this way. Okay? Picture your eyes looking that way. This area of the earth is your left brain. This area of the earth is your right brain. And if you understand how religious ideologies are structured on earth, this begins to make a whole lot of sense. Because we have three basic astrotheological sects that each correlate to a major world religion. Um, the, the Solar sect of astrotheology is named after uh, the god um, Horus. And Horus's name in uh, other Egyptian, um, uh, in other Egyptian uh, cosmological um, uh, uh, studies was, his name was Amen-Ra. Amen-Ra is the name that is invoked when Christians pray a prayer and then they say the word Amen after the prayer is said to invoke the sun god of Amen-Ra. What he really represented was the sun at his zenith, at his highest point in the sky Amen-Ra uh, represented. So it is the sun not at each horizon, uh, at, the, at the rising horizon, he could be called Horus, the golden falcon, at the setting horizon, he is set, but at the zenith, his highest point in his arc across the sky, he was known as Amun-Ra. And often this was just shortened to Ra or Re, uh, where we get the word rays of the sun from. So it's another name for the sun god Horus. And we have seen that this is the religion of Christianity, and its symbol is the sun on the cross. There you have the sun behind the cross right there. And I'm going to place the blade as this western left hemispherical religion, the male religion. So the symbol I'm placing on the sun here is the blade, the upward pointing triangle representing yang energy, male energy. The moon cult or sect of astrotheology is named after the moon goddess Isis, depicted here. So this is Isis. The moon religion is the predominant religion of the Eastern Hemisphere, and it is Islam. Islam's main symbol is the crescent moon. And we see, just as Christianity is the predominant religion of the Western left brain of the Earth, the left hemisphere, and it's a male principle, the um, religion of Islam means surrender. The word Islam means surrender to God because it is the religion of the predominant religion of the right brain hemisphere, which is passive or surrendering. So Isis correlates to the right hemisphere of the earth and the right brain hemisphere of uh, the, the human brain. And on the moon, I'm going to place the inverted uh, uh, triangle known as the chalice. Now there's another world religion and it is based upon the um, sect of astrotheology of the stars and planets. So the creator god Osiris is looked at as the god of all the stars because he's the god of all the suns. He created the heavens. And um, in um, Phoenicia Cana, he was the um, ruler of the planet Saturn. Saturn is the, um, is the planet that is farthest from the sun that can still be seen with the, uh, with the naked eye. So his orbit is seen to encompass all other planets. As such, he's the ruler of the planets that, that, revol that revolve around the sun, that have orbits around the sun. And in, uh, in, um, <coughs> in Semitic religions, ancient Semitic religions, this god was known as El. It's where it means God, the word El. In uh, Judaism, which is what uh, the, uh, Judaism 
is actually this aspect of astrotheology. Its religion, uh, its symbol is the star. Okay, the stars, because it is the religion of the stars and the planets, the pinpoints of light, as we talked about them, the, the small lights in the heavens. So, uh, the, the name of God in Judaism is Elohim, and it's plural. The reason it's plural is because there isn't one God. There's many gods. Elohim means the stars and planets. That's why, that's the big mystery about why El is pluralized in the Bible. Because the real astrotheological basis of Judaism is the stars and the planets, plural, the many lights of the heavens. So that's where Elohim is actually derived. And of course, just like their symbol being the star, it's the combination of the male and the female symbols into one. Now, the reason that there is a twofold aspect to uh, the middle part, the middle pillar of the earth, is because in the middle, if we're looking at the brain from the back side of the brain, okay, so your head is actually facing this way, and you're imagining this side as your left brain hemisphere, this side as your right brain hemisphere, what do we see playing out in the world today? We see the left-brained Christian nations of the Western Hemisphere waging war against the right-brained Islamic surrendering nations, or the, the ideology of the surrender to God as being their religion, the basis of their religion. We're waging war over here in the Eastern Hemisphere, in this region, okay? Um, so it's like the left brain is over attacking the right brain. And the Middle East, the Middle Eastern region is where all of this conflict is, is centered. And the reason that it's centered on that part of the earth is because this region of the earth is the back of the brain of the earth. It is the cerebellum of the earth. The opposite side of the Earth is where the Pacific Ocean is at. So that's where the energies are truly united on the opposite side of the Earth, the peaceful ocean, uh, Pacific, peaceful. It's the prefrontal neocortex of the Earth, the third eye of the planet, so to speak, and right on the other side, of the globe from this point, you would see in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Hawaiian Islands, with the largest volcano on the Earth, Mauna Kea Volcano, on the big island of Hawaii. It is the, the physical representation of the third eye of the planetary brain. All the conflict is happening on the other side, the back of the head of the Earth, the cerebellum of Earth. Uh, which is the Middle Eastern region, Middle Earth, the, around the Mediterranean region. So this is a proof of the hermetic principle of as above, so below. As the individual units of consciousness upon the planet become imbalanced toward one polarity or the other, you will see the reflection happen on a grand scale on the entire planet. The Earth is in a state of left brain imbalance because we are in a state of left brain imbalance. And we are seeing all the conflict driven by the R complex of the Earth, which is the Middle Eastern region, which correlates, it maps symbolically to the cerebellum of the earth. If another country happened to be there at that location, that's where you would see the turmoil and conflict happen. It is, it is a reflection of the hermetic principle. As the individual goes, as all the collective, indi uh, collective uh, individuals go on the planet, as their consciousness goes, so the mass consciousness will go and you will see it reflected on a grand scale. So as we see these three religions put together of Judaism, 
Christianity and Islam, when we put them all together, we get ISIS, which is Islam, the lunar religion, Ra, or Horus, the solar religion of Christianity, and El, the religion of Judaism. We get ISIS plus Ra plus El, and that spells the word Israel. Now, this is important to understand because you have to understand that this region of the world is where these astrotheological sects actually consolidated the knowledge of the mystery traditions and then began to disseminate their knowledge and culture into other regions of the world. So it is um, simply an understanding that that knowledge was concentrated in that region of the world before it then began to go out and populate other areas of the world with that information. And this is uh, one of the main reasons why the country of Israel, the government of Israel, has so much influence with m many uh, other nations more po populated than it and seemingly wielding more political power, but there is such a concentration of uh, the ability to lobby uh, these other nations, such as the United States and Great Britain, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with the uh, desires of the government of Israel, because the, the, the power of these astrotheological sects is still highly concentrated in the region that we now call Israel, which was formerly Phoenicia Cana, uh, and the, the knowledge of the mystery traditions actually came into that region through uh, Egypt and Babylon and uh, the, uh, the, the mystery tradition centers that were around what we now call the state of Israel. So that explains why Israel is so influential in what is taking place uh, in the Middle East region of the world and it explains why the ties with uh, larger, more populous nations are in place.